let's take out our Bibles and learn together. Are you a modern day Pharisee? And what I mean by that is this. Have you failed to understand the biblical truth concerning the kingdom of God? We have seen in our last two studies that there is an inherent relationship between a proper understanding of Shabbat, that is, the Sabbath day, and a proper understanding of the kingdom of God. Now, we have not spoken about Shabbat observance. What we've talked about is understanding the Sabbath day, its message, what God has done on that first Shabbat after the six days of creation, and how that should impact how we think and how we behave. So with that said, to get your Bible and look with me to the Gospel of Luke and chapter 14, the book of Luke and chapter 14. Now, at the end of our last study, we see that Messiah said something. He taught us that we should not be looking for earthly things, but that we should live in a way, let me say that differently, that we should behave in a humble manner in order that we do not receive earthly blessings, but we're more interested in kingdom blessings. And when we properly understand the Shabbat, we are going to make wise decisions that have kingdom implications. That's what we're called to do. So look with me to that last verse that we studied in the previous study. Verse 14, when he says, They will not be able to recompense you, for you will be given, and this means a reward, you will be receiving recompense at the resurrection of the righteous. And this resurrection of the righteous is inherently tied to the establishment of the kingdom of God. Now, notice Messiah said that to the leader of that home, the one who had invited him. But notice what happens in the next verse, our first verse in our study today. Look at verse 15 where it says, but... A certain one of the recliners, so those who were invited, having heard these things, this one said to him, Blessed is who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, do you understand what this one was saying? He says, Blessed is the one who will eat bread, meaning receive God's provision in the kingdom of God. And what this one was saying to Yeshua is, I reject you and I reject what you are saying. In fact, what he is trying to convey is this. Blessed is the one who's going to be in the kingdom of God. And by the way, you, Yeshua, will not be there. Now, this one gets it totally wrong. Do you understand what's taking place here? Who is this one speaking to? He's speaking to the king of the kingdom of God, the one who is going to inherit everything from his heavenly father, from God himself. And therefore, this one does not understand the Shabbat, nor does he understand the identity of Yeshua. And this is the problem. If we do not understand the foundational things in the Word of God, we're not going to understand the more significant things. And I'm speaking about the identity of this one called Yeshua Menetzrat, Jesus of Nazareth. So he says, blessed or happy, that same word, is whom will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Verse 16, but uh, he said to him, and who's speaking? Yeshua. He's going to give another parable. He says to him, a certain man made a great dinner. Now, this word can imply 
a dinner, a meal, but usually it is used in regard to a greater celebration. A celebration that usually has some type of biblical significance. That there's some action like a marriage or a a birth of a child, a circumcision, something that has biblical connection. And therefore, he says, there was a certain man that made a great dinner, and he called many, verse 17. So his uh, desire was to see many people come to his event. Verse 17. And he sent his servant for the sake of the hour of the dinner, meaning when that time came, to go and to speak to the ones who were invited. And what did he say? Middle of verse 17. Come, because already is prepared all thanks. Now, if you know Hebrew, modern Hebrew, that expression already is used so frequently. In modern Hebrew, the word kavar. And what it means is that everything has been accomplished. Everything is already prepared. And therefore, what he's looking for is a response. For people to, having been invited, act on his invitation. Remember that. He is wanting people to act on his invitation to come to this great banquet. And what do you think is being taught here? Well, again, we need to remember that we have been speaking about the Sabbath day. And the Sabbath day, as I said in our first study in chapter 14, And last week in our second study, the Shabbat is related to the kingdom of God. And therefore, this invitation, if we understand what is taking place in this parable, the invitation is not just to a meal, not just to an earthly celebration, but it parallels being invited into the kingdom of God. And that is the greatest invitation that a person can receive. So this servant, his servant, went out at the hour of the banquet and he spoke to the ones who had been invited and he said, come, because already is all things prepared. Verse 18. Now notice this banquet is a great banquet. And we're going to see that the word that is used to describe this one who's holding this, who is the master of this banquet, is someone who is a very wealthy. He is called the master of the estate. So he has great, great uh, resources that he's going to utilize for this, this meal, this celebration. But notice what happens, verse 18. And they began from one, and the implication is from one to the first to the last. They all began to make excuses. Middle of verse 18. The first one said to him, A field I have bought, and I have necessity. I have a need to go forth and to see it. I ask you that you have me excused now something doesn't really make much sense he has already purchased the field now his need for going to see it would have been before before he acted and made this transaction but it's already done what it's saying is this this one is so excited about the field, that he prefers to go to the field and see what he has purchased rather than rather than attending this banquet. So it shows that he is more committed to this, this earthly experience, this earthly purchase, rather than what this banquet relates to, and that is the kingdom of God. Let's move on to verse 19. And another... 
said, Five yoke of oxen I have bought, and I am going to test these. Now, again, the purchase has already been made. It's been done. But nevertheless, what we see here is this. This one is more interested, more committed, more excited about testing these five yoke of oxen that he purchased rather than what? Rather than attending this great banquet. And once again, we see the same thing being taught to us. These first two had a greater interest, a greater commitment in the things of this world rather than the kingdom of God. This is what is being referred to in this passage. This is what the reader needs to grasp. Now move on. He says, I say to you, have me excused. Verse 20. Now, the 20th verse relates to another invited guest. And many people who look at this will think, well, of the three, this one had a legitimate reason. But what I'm going to suggest to you is that he had the worst reason. Why? Well, we need to always understand the context of this passage. And every passage in the Holy Scriptures. They were written by Jewish individuals, even this book of Luke. When you study Luke's gospel, you find that Luke had a great understanding of Judaism. And therefore, it was written by Jews to a Jewish community that would have understood something. See, when you have an event, that event has a different status attached to it. For example, in Israel, where I live, I was living in a different location in the north of Israel, not far from the Lebanese border, and a man was doing something. He was remembering his father. His father had died exactly one year ago. And therefore, it is customary for a, a son who has completed his mourning period, but nevertheless on the anniversary of his father or mother's death, he makes a, a meal in the synagogue. And he's asked to, to pray at the service, to lead it. He gets this honor. And he gets this honor because in Judaism, and this doesn't make it right, but the belief is that he has this dinner. He does this act of kindness by, by providing a meal for people, and that benefits the spiritual condition of his departed parent. Now, obviously, that is not biblically sound. The scripture says it's appointed unto man to die once, and after that, the judgment. You, this is the false teaching that was also prevalent in Catholicism known as indulgences, that, that you give money in the name of the dead one in order to, to shorten his time in, in purgatory. Now, the Bible doesn't speak about purgatory. That is a false doctrine. But what you may not know is this concept of suffering after death for a period of time. Purgatory does not originate in Catholicism. It was, was taken from Judaism. And it's wrong for Catholicism to teach this, and it's wrong for Judaism to teach it. It's false. But, but this is what was done. And therefore, what we, we understand is this. When there's another event, you're able to share this meal for another purpose and lift up, meaning have greater significance, elevate the significance of that meal. For example, and this is a true story, I was, was at a synagogue in the north of Israel, and a man was doing just that, having what's called a yard site for his father. And what happens? Well, he was told, there's a young couple. They just got married. 
but they have no financial means to have a reception. And they asked this man, would you take your food and, and, and allow it to be used for their reception? And what did he do? He immediately agreed. Why? Because a wedding is a, a main event in Judaism. It is the establishment of a covenant, a marriage covenant. Therefore, this man was glad. Why? It gave greater significance to his father's meal. Now, again, this is not proper. It is not biblically sound, but this is the context. And notice here what happens. Look at the next verse, verse uh, uh, tw uh, 20, where it says, and another said, I have just taken a wife. And on account of this, I'm not able to come. So he just simply says, he doesn't say, please excuse me, accept my, my request to have me excuse. All he says is, I've just gotten married and therefore I cannot come. Now, you may not know this, but part of the, the Jewish wedding is that for the next six nights the first night we have one blessing and the next six nights we have six additional blessings and these blessings are said at the time of the meal and therefore someone who was just married as we see he can't do anything he has to be part of these what's known as sheva brachot the seven blessings in order to complete his marriage process. And therefore, he could have come. In fact, it could have changed the status of this great banquet into something more, a wedding banquet. Now, that should, should cause us to, to think for a moment because there's going to be a great kingdom banquet, and that is known as the marriage banquet of the Lamb. But what happens? This one has no interest in interest in participating in this great banquet notice what is said look now to verse 21 and that servant having arrived announced to his lord these things and and here's this word i was telling you about it's the word oko despatos which is a word which means the master of a house probably better understood as the master of a great estate. And it says here, then this master of the house was made angry. And he said to his servant, go forth quickly into the streets and the alleys of the city. And the poor and the handicapped and the lame and the blind you bring in here now notice this what does he do he brings in and there's a change those who were invited we're going to talk more about them in a moment but he starts to bring in those who are the outcasts of society as he says here those who are poor those who are lame those who are handicapped and those who are blind he says, bring them here. Look now to verse 22. And the servant said, Lord, it has been done as you have commanded. So this servant is obedient. He follows the commands, the instructions of, of his master. And he says, look at the end of verse 22. He says, and still there is place, meaning there's still room for others. Verse 23, and the Lord said to the servant. Now, notice the change. We, we had simply a certain man having this great banquet. That's how he was referred to initially, a certain man. And then there was a change, and he was called this master of the estate a term of honor, a term of power, a term of, of resources and authority. But as we see now, there's an additional change. 
now he is called the lord and this gives us a kingdom connection because we're speaking about the lord of lords we're speaking about messiah wanting to have his wedding banquet full and it says here keep reading in this text where it says and the lord said to his servant go out into the ways and the hedges and compel them to enter into my house so that it shall be made full now we have something go out into the ways and what else it speaks here about the fences or some bibles and this is probably more accurate the hedges now what does that mean well when someone is very very poor they don't have a place to live and therefore they would have to do things they would have to use the restroom well they don't have a restroom and therefore it was very common in this culture at that time for someone to relieve themselves in what's known as the hedges going into the bushes so they have privacy a little dignity a little honor for themselves not doing this act in a public way so these would have been the poorest of the poor and this is what he's saying here now remember what we learned last week those same terms were used those who are are poor handicapped lame and blind and what's happening well those who were invited they didn't have an interest they weren't interested in this banquet which has kingdom implications why they were interested in the things of this world and therefore they weren't humble they weren't kingdom minded and they were not kingdom committed let me ask you are you do you make decisions based upon a kingdom influence do you make decisions building up rewards for the kingdom of god not that people in this world can can compensate you recompense you give you something in return but doing it to those who can't why so at the resurrection of the righteous you'll be compensated by who god and god's compensation is far better than having a a field having five yoke of oxen or anything else that this world can offer so he says here go forth into the ways it could be highways and the hedges and compel and the implication is that they be compelled to enter in in order that my house shall be full verse 24. now we're going to see something else we're going to see and this one who is speaking represents the lord and what is he going to say very clearly verse 24 for i say to you that none of those men the ones who had been invited shall taste my banquet now those are pretty strong words none of those who were invited notice there was an invitation but those who were invited those who were called those who should have responded they did not now if you're part of a false theology known as calvinism or or reformed theology this scripture is very problematic because there were those who were called but because they did not respond they did not have a kingdom interest they will never taste that that banquet they're not going to have a kingdom experience let me wrap up by saying this god loves you and god just doesn't say he loves you we find that he has demonstrated his love for you how by by sending his only son into this world to die a death a death that was cruel and barbaric on a cross and prior to being crucified we know 
that he was flogged intensely. He suffered because God loved you so much. And now he makes an invitation and, and be assured of something. The only way to experience reconciliation with God, let me say that differently, the only way to experience the forgiveness of your sins, to take hold of the mercy and the grace of God is by confessing, yes, I'm a sinner. And I trust in the all-sufficient work of the Messiah on that cross that he died on Passover, the day of redemption, to redeem me. That I might be forgiven eternally and that I might experience eternal redemption and have that declaration that I am declared righteous through the blood of Christ. And therefore, I have eternal hope, a hope that will not disappoint. And therefore, I have assurance that I will be in the kingdom of God, not based upon what I have done, but based upon what he has done for me. See, if you reject that, you will not experience the kingdom of God. You will be cast outside where you will know eternal torment, sorrow, and fear. It's just that simple. There's only one way. Now, you may doubt that, but you will have eternal regret if you reject this gospel. This may be your opportunity, your only opportunity, to say yes to what the Bible calls good news and receive the free gift. There's very few things that are truly free in this world, but this is a free gift. Messiah paid the price. He did the work of redemption so that you can be eternally reconciled. He loves you so. Receive that, that message of hope, the only message of hope. Receive salvation by accepting Messiah as your Lord and Savior. Confessing your sins and believing not only did he die, but on that third day he rose from the dead signifying the victory that he wants to share with you a kingdom victory where you'll know the experience of joy, having that great banquet experience in the kingdom of God. Shalom.